interesting about this class, um, that lecture, I, one of the lectures I recorded, that's the one for next Wednesday, or, um, it's all about <coughs> characterization and calibration. And so one of the guys from the space grant wants to learn about characterization and calibration. So after class, he's coming by. I sent him a copy of the slides. Okay, well. So are the project proposals due today? Pardon me? So are the project proposals due today? They're due today, but if you get them in over the weekend, I'm happy. Okay. Or uh, if you're going to email them, you know, then you should email them today. <laughs> but it's just two pages, so. Oh, two pages. Not, not really. Oh, just two. Okay. I've gotten two in already, and one's Earth and one's space, so that's pretty typical. Okay, let's see what's going on here. So for the projects, what level of detail are you looking for? The online examples had very, very different levels there. Um, it, it's kind of up to you. Um, since we are, since this is a class in instrumentation, mm -hmm. you know, if you put more detail into the instrument itself, that's probably appropriate. Okay. Um, I don't expect a lot of detail about the spacecraft or any of that stuff, but it it's how <coughs> your measurements would, you know, fulfill what you think your sensor should be doing. How original should it be? Pardon me? How original should the instrument be? Well, you know, people have been asking me that. Um, at this day and age, a lot of the things have been done. But if you can come up with an original idea, that's fine. If you want to come up with a different way to make a measurement that's been made for a long time, that's fine. Um, if you just want to basically refresh how that measurement has been made, uh, you know, I can't really argue with that because you know, it's it's becoming harder to get really unique ideas because a lot of things have been done. But there's still a lot of interesting things out there. Okay. Yeah, but it's up to you. This should be a class where you can be as creative as you can afford to be. <laughs> you know, you you the only limitation is how much you want to study the problem and and uh, so you're going to you're going to do a lot of your own research learning about that particular problem you'll go well beyond any of the lectures or anything trying to define what what their <coughs> what the important aspects are well i guess we should go ahead uh, i don't think we're going to see <coughs> i don't know it's all guys today we're, the girls left us. <laughs> okay, finishing up that, that last lecture, um, we were talking about um, the various aspects of building things. And <clears throat> we're going to talk about this. This is the, a particular instrument. This is the VIRS, the Visible Infrared Radiation Suite. It's really just one instrument. It has a rotating telescope. That's kind of a unique aspect. It hasn't been done before, and you can see <clears throat> these dichroics that I've talked about splitting off the various wavelengths. So these little languages, this is long wave infrared, short wave infrared, mid wave infrared. So that's what the mirror sphere <clears throat> is all about. Visible near infrared. Okay, and so those are, that's one channel because it's all, all visible and non-visible but still optical <clears throat> and these are these are thermal channels so they're separated out because they're going to use a different detector and the, their detector has to use radiative cooling so there are <clears throat> all these aspects and here shows you the scan um, opportunity so this is a reference black body Solar diffuser, giving you a visible reference. Space view, which gives you the thermal cold reference. 
This one gives you the thermal warm reference, and then here it views the Earth. These are the pieces of this instrument, so you can see, <clears throat> you know, how basically large they are. This is the rotating telescope, the scan motor that keeps this thing rotating. This is the black body. Um, <clears throat> this is a radiator panel for cooling the black body. So you like to do that um, passively. If you do it actively, you have to put on things like nitrogen doors, which run out of nitrogen. When they run out of nitrogen, they don't cool anymore. So <clears throat> passive instrument, passive cooling is very attractive. Um, <clears throat> this is the cryo radiator door, and this is really this is interesting because it's a, a frequently a point of failure. This is put on there during the launch, and then it has to open up when it gets up there. And frequently, the device set up to open the door, move away the shade, fails, and then you have a problem. You can't go up and fix it. So these are all important components. Now, the way these complex instruments are built, they create what are called integrated product teams, IPTs. So you have teams for each aspect. So <clears throat> there's an IPT that sort of has the overall uh, view. So the next uh, lecture we're going to talk about systems engineering. And system engineering is kind of, you know, when you think about it, when you think about the class in it, it's kind of boring because it doesn't really teach you anything specifically. The problem with system is engineering, you have to consider everything. So you end up with this environment where everything affects everything. So the system engineer has to be aware of all of these problems. And his job, his or her job, is to overview what's going on and try to catch the interactions that can be problems. So there's an optical, optomechanical IPT. So there's a team whose job it is to worry about the optics and the mechanics that are necessary to carry out that <coughs> optical measurement. So these, <coughs> this team needs to look at the trades. Trades are basic, are, are the nature of doing this kind of work. You try to find out the best solution or is there a, something should be done better? Would you do this better? Would that improve some other part? So <clears throat> you have to look at what kind of scan. Is it a push broom, which is just moving the detectors ahead, whisk broom, where it's actually physically moving across the track? How big should the entrance aperture be? And in and, <clears throat> and the first, in the Wednesday of next week, we talk about the diffraction limit. The diffraction limit will tell you <clears throat> the size of the aperture that you need to have the resolution you want. So that tells you how much light you need to collect. What a, sort of telescopes? And you're going to focus the light onto the detector. And so <clears throat> basically in space, we don't end up using lenses because lenses take long focal lengths and a lot of room. So we end up using mirrors. So we <clears throat> um, need to look at the different spectral bands. Um, what do we need to do to separate them? And we'll talk about different ways of separating optical radiation. Um, then you have to worry about the mechanics. How do you mount them? Um, <clears throat> how do you isolate them from other movements? And then you have to worry about how your instruments mounted to the spacecraft. We talked about that and the fact that you need these little cubes that tell you where to put it. And the material, you have to worry about the material because you can get bimetallic effects and you don't want that. You know, that that's <coughs> will cause degradation. And for a microwave instrument, then the biggest problem is the antenna. What kind of antenna do you need? How big is it? going to be. Um, 
As I've said, one of the most critical elements in an optical instrument is the focal plane array. So you would clearly have a focal plane team, the IPT, and these guys are just worried about getting the focal plane to perform to the specification that you're required. So this is where the detectors reside. And we're going to have a number of lectures about detectors and how they work. And we're going to talk about <coughs> um, we're going to talk about CMOS and CCDs arrays and how they function and which one's better or worse or what the different aspects are. So uh, <clears throat> this is a really important area for any kind of an optical instrument. So these are common trades. How many focal planes do we need to cover all of the spectral bands? Um, <clears throat> can, can we put the infrared sensing detectors on the, the same focal plane, or do we need different ones? What size and types of detectors should we use? And um, we'll look at the multiplicity of trying to select detectors, because these kinds of charts that you see, they're functions of wavelength, but they have all these different curves on them. It's hard to pick out the one that you, you think is going to do what you want. So should we use arrays of detectors, or should we use a single big detector? How many dead detectors are permissible without endangering the mission? So if you have a focal plane array, if you start losing elements of the focal plane, how many can you lose and still collect a useful image? Do we have redundant sets of detectors? In other words, if one goes out, can we have another one take its place, kind of like how sharks have teeth? How do we collect the signal from the detectors into a readout? So this is moving the data from the detector, which is sensing the photons, turn it into an electric signal that we can then process. And how long do we integrate the measurements? So how long can we collect the radiation? Then there's an electronics team, and these guys build the data system. They're the ones that you're going to deliver an electronic signal to them, and they are going to develop the systems that <clears throat> process the data, store the data. And you, you end up with some fundamental basic kinds of questions. So um, what are the data that we need to be able to handle? Um, <clears throat> what kind of an A to D analog to digital conversion are we using? Um, so how precisely do we need to know the signal? That's going to be a question of how many bits. And, you know, now, nowadays we, we have data is not such a problem as it used to be, and so we have a lot more bits than we used to have. And do you really need data compression? Can you keep all of the bits, or do you have to somehow <coughs> compress it and lose some of those bits, and if you do lose them, does it make any difference? So can we, can we toss some of the data in a lossy compression, or must we have it with completely lossless compression so that we could recover the full signal? How much power can we take from the spacecraft? Okay, the spacecraft has a certain amount of power that it can provide. And, and this is true of UAVs, for example. If you're going to fly on a UAV, you need to have an instrument that doesn't demand too much power from the plane because it can't provide that much power. Okay, um, <clears throat> where should this, this is, seems trivial, where should the electronics box be mounted? But it needs to be in a place that's kind of out of the way. You don't want it. And, and yet you want to be able to access this later when you're into the calibration characterization phase. You want to be able to get back into the box. And then there's a big, big thing that is often overlooked. What sort of cables are used for connecting all of these components, and where do you put them? And um, <clears throat> I think I told you, I, I, Noah used to have this attitude that they wouldn't go into safe hold mode. 
And so they collected some really nice data of one of their satellites burning out. When they had the failure review board, the guy that ran it was a friend of mine, and he said it was pretty easy to figure out what happened. They, they located the instrument that was shorting out, and they basically nailed it down to when, when they installed the Teflon boards, somebody over-tightened a screw, went through the Teflon board, hit the substrate, and shorted the instrument out. And then it merely went up the cable and shorted everything else out. So uh, <clears throat> it's as simple as, as an over-tightened screw. These are other IPTs and groups. So flight software, um, <clears throat> you need to be able to handle a variety of contingencies. Thermal control, you've got to have thermal control of not only the spacecraft but of the instruments because the satellite's going to have to do a lot of that as well. The instrument's going to have its own thermal control, but the satellite may be providing a lot of the, uh, <clears throat> the thermal uh, compensation. Then you have to have registration and navigation, so you have to be able to locate the data on the ground. Otherwise, it's not very useful. So if you're looking at the ground, you really would like to know where, where this stuff is located. Calibration. Now, this is going to be a big deal, and we're going to talk about it, like I said, next Wednesday. Um, calibration is really the, co the, the transformation from the bits we get out of the instrument into a measured quantity. Okay? And, and that can only be done by calibration. And you have to realize that, you know, you, you're going to do this calibration before the instrument is launched. Okay? After it's launched, you can't redo that calibration. Now, we do a lot of things we call vicarious calibration. And by this vicarious calibration, what we do is we, we look at basically uniform targets that we think we understand the <clears throat> reflectance of or the radiation of. Like um, Phil Slater loved this <clears throat> the thing called railroad playa down in New Mexico. Or you can look at white sand. So you look at things that you think are essentially uniform, and then you look at what the satellite has measured of that target, and you try to verify that it has the calibration that you did before launch. Is it still valid? So uh, how frequently should we revisit our, our reference points and <clears throat> check out the black body? So um, the instrument's going to degrade over time. It's just all instruments do. When they degrade up in space, well, you hope it's not the RMS errors that are getting bigger. You hope it's a bias that you can actually correct for. Okay. Um, we're going to have a lot more sl slides about systems engineering, so I'm not going to talk about it here. Okay, um, any questions? Why are the girls out here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm good. What? Never mind. No? You have a question? No. No? Okay. All right, so this next lecture is about systems engineering. So, <clears throat> fundamental law of systems engineering. Everything interacts with everything. Everything goes somewhere. You have to put everything into there, and there's no such thing as a free lunch. So it's not easy. That's what that last one saying. It's not a simple problem. What is systems engineering? It's an interdisciplinary means to realize complex capabilities. Sounds like a lot of garbly gook. Um, the science community has been really good at bantering around this word interdisciplinary. But here it really means something because this person has to be aware of all those other things we just talked about. Okay? And this person has to look at it at sort of a 40,000 foot level. They can't afford to get down in the weeds. They need to look at how these things are functioning, 
but at a much higher level. So they need to be able to think about design, manufacture, integrate, test, all of those things that are happening at the same time. They need to think about them. So they need to analyze the system and the design pro process and what's going to happen um, when you go through these different stages. So concept, design, develop, build, operate, and terminate. His, history of systems engineering. It's kind of recent, really. Bell Laboratories started this in the 1900s, um, looking to come up with a systemized way of developing products. And the Rand Corporation, who was very famous in the 40s and 50s, are doing a lot of this kind of stuff. They, they carried on systems analysis. First teaching of these concepts were at MIT in the 1950s. So systems engineering type terminology, design. Design is concepts through requirements allocation. Okay. So that's kind of what you do in this class. We won't be able to, we don't have any money to build anything. So you're basically going to be doing this first part of it. You're going to be de designing a, an instrument. Development is where you convert those requirements into something. You actually build it. And I think, as I've told you and I've told you in the recorded lectures, the first thing that the companies build is a thing called an engineering model. So they build this engineering model, which is destined to stay on the ground. Why would it stay on the ground? Yeah. If something breaks up in space, you can try to replicate it on the ground? Exactly. Yeah. You, you remember the Apollo 13 mo movie? It was a good example because they had a copy of the module that was broken, and they were poking and working on it to try to tell people what to do up there. So if they had not had a copy of it, they weren't, wouldn't be able to explore what, what needs to be done. So that's the main reason. Um, it's been interesting over the history of, of remote sensing that a lot of the engineering models have, when the uh, flight hardware has failed, have been fixed up and launched, <laughs> put into space. So engineering models have made it, engineering versions have in, made it into space. You need to worry about integration, the various components, and then there's the test and analysis, and that's the stuff I recorded for, for Wednesday. This is the basic diagram of systems engineering. So you have this V diagram, and if you look at it, then here you go where you're understanding the requirements, you develop the system specifications, you go into <coughs> higher order specs where you get the more detailed sort of numbers, then you get into the design to build, and then you actually build stuff, and then you start verifying it, and you start testing it, and so this goes from the concept into the final demonstration on the ground. So that's what this is. So this is the decomposition and design phase, and this is the integration and qualification phase. <clears throat> so this is how you do, um, this, these are all considered inputs. So you have a plan and criteria interpret the user needs, develop the concepts, decompose the concepts into the different bits, and then you start developing what you're going to build, analyze, assess, you then actually end up building and testing. So the requirements <clears throat> decomposition process, so you have some requirements and this is something that you guys will be involved with. So you, you need to see how you can meet this and look at what you're doing to meet that 
and you have to decide whether it meets it or not. Other, if it doesn't, you've got to go back and reiterate until you get to the point where you finally have a solution. So who is your customer? What are the customer's requirements? What are the options? How will you structure your program to build what you need? What's the best approach? What are the risks in this technology? How will you demonstrate you've met the requirements? And then there's finally this business-based transition where you actually <coughs> uh, satisfy the customer. Key questions provide the loops and balances and control of the systems engineering process. So decomposition of the elements, complete the higher level requirements, then divide that into lower partitions of functioning. <clears throat> Verification means integral element. So the, the first steps, of, and even in your project, where you set, I'm, I want to measure this thing or these, these things, these parameters, it's the first thing you do. And then you say, OK, if I'm going to do that, what is my best approach to measuring that? What kind of an instrument do I need to have? And then you go further and you say, okay, what kind, what are the components that this instrument has to have to be able to make that measurement to fulfill those requirements? <clears throat> and this is the final stuff where, you know, these are, if you actually were able to build one, you would test it and you would see how it performed. And we're going to talk more about risk, budget, and schedule. These are all very important factors if you're actually doing this for a, a company because these are things that are controlling a lot of your decisions. This is an earth imaging sensor, <clears throat> an example. And so this one has a number of bands. These are the visible bands. Here's the near-infrared, shortwave infrared. This is a panchromatic band, so that's all of the visible bands together. And uh, then this is a band just for cirrus clouds. This is the ground sample distance. Remember the GSD is a separation between those little Gaussians. <coughs> um, this is a signal to noise ratio. Now notice all of these bands, can, you can use the signal to noise ratio. It actually, in the shortwave infrared, you could also use the NE delta T, the measure of noise equivalent uh, change in temperature. When you get into the infrared, the long wave infrared, you can't use signal to noise anymore. Okay, you have to use <coughs> the no this noise equivalent change in temperature. So <clears throat> this is giving you the mass, the volume, the average power that it requires, reliability, and th that's an estimate. You do that. Okay, operational lifetime, calibration sources. So those are all components. So these are some specification for this example. Um, has a 177 kilometer field of view, which is pretty large. Uh, <clears throat> that's, that's its sample space. 30 meter resolution, uh, has to have the right orbit, has to survive the space environment. Now the space environment, you know, if you're down at a few hundred kilometers, like uh, the worldview satellites are from Digital Globe, it's not a very nasty place. You get up to 800 kilometers, it's getting a little worse, but still not bad. You get up to 1300, the environment's not very friendly. It's got lots of cosmic rays, lots of stuff coming in. Solar wind can bother you. It's, it, it's something you have to consider. You get up to 36,000 kilometers like the geobirds, then there's all kinds of stuff that you have to protect from. Um, <clears throat> emerging requirements, you, you may want to reduce your sensor requirements to actually achieve what you're going to get. Uh, it would be nice if companies really did this 
frequently they will just parrot back to the funding agency, we'll do what you ask, even if it's not really quite possible. Okay, derived requirements. Well, this is telling us <clears throat> how many pixels and what the margin of that is and what the orbit uncertainty can be. Okay, um, you hear a lot about V and V. V and V is verification and validation. Now, these are actually different things. Verification just says, okay, I said that this instrument would make this measurement, okay? And can I repeat it? It's kind of like repeatability. Can I, can I make this measurement on a regular basis? That's verification. Validation says, how accurate is that measurement? I want that measurement to be this accurate. So validation actually would compare with some ground truth source and say, yeah, I can make it uh, that, that accurate. So um, <clears throat> there are a lot of these things that are pass-fail, um, and then some are measured values, like validation is really a measured value. Can you exceed that value? And uh, <clears throat> verification can basically be pass-fail. So this is the verification validation stuff. And so these are all plans that you develop that then dictate what happens in terms of the veri verification and validation. So the big questions to answer is, does it do what it was intended? Does it work as designed? Do the parts do their functions? Was it built as it was designed? So these are examples of things we need to worry about. Um, detectors, so their sensitivity. <coughs> Pixel registration, whether their pixels are in the right place. Um, analog signal noise, and we'll talk about a number of sources of noise. You have this stuff called shot noise, and you have a bunch of other noise sources, thermal noise, that can get into any of these instruments. Um, <clears throat> the focal plane array, we've already talked about how important that is. It needs to have good stability. You don't want it to, you know, oscillate over time. Vibration and shock stability, you want it to be pretty independent of what's happening to the instrument. And you want it to be resistant to this thermal load. And the MTA <coughs> uh, BF is the mean time before failure. That tells you how long the instrument really should work. So these are governed by test plans. Um, so if we have an imager, we're worried about the frames per orbit, operational lifetime. Not, most of the operational lifetimes have been extremely conservative. They put up a satellite and they say it's going to operate for three years, and it operates for 15 years. Now, if things degrade, things are it's usually not ticking right along in its later life, but it's still functioning. So some of these operating lifetimes have been extremely conservative. Annual operating costs, you'd like to know how much it's going to cost to really operate this thing. And that has to do with, you know, people on the ground and operating the satellite and um, what kind of maintenance is required. The whole data system to work with the data system. And then there's the science support that people actually look at the data. Okay, uncertainty engineering. This is kind of interesting. What is uncertainty engineering? This means that, you know, in some cases we're using unproven technologies. Sometimes we're going to operate in unknown or at least unusual operating conditions. Sometimes we want to measure something we haven't measured before. Um, this is a general kind of problem malaise that influence all of this activity. We live in a world of variable budgets and we may have changing science goals. Okay, risk. Okay, this is the problem that something will occur that changes the program. So there's very different elements of risk. Planning, identification, analysis, and then mitigation and tracking. 
So caught, types of risks. Cost is a big one. Schedule, schedule, type, cost and schedule is somewhat the same. Technical, will the performance meet the expectations? And programmatic, will the agency that's funding this come by tomorrow and say, we're not interested anymore, we want you to scale this way back. This is the kind of chart you see if you go to one of these companies where you're trying to um, look at risk. And so this is a map of risk. So the green stuff is OK. Um, yellow, you don't want to do. And red is a disaster. So <clears throat> these are things that can come up. So and and they they have to do with different levels. So here's the levels of of problem one through five, and this is the probability of them occurring. So uh, <clears throat> you know one says things are okay. Five says you can't, you just can't function with that. Okay, and so you can see where <clears throat> the the greatest majority is between three and four, which is still not really very attractive. I, I didn't put this in. This came from Norm Anderson. So uh, <clears throat> I don't know how anybody feels about Dilbert. I kind of like Dilbert. He's kind of weird. So here are his, his risks. And he says, I don't understand this risk. That's number 36. So that's another another risk. This guy can't understand anything. Anyway, um, there are a number of ways to try to identify the risks. And, and, it's, and it's funny because, you know, I've been sitting in on programs where they very clearly identified the risk, had a diagram like this, had some big red boxes that you were worried about, and they went ahead and did it anyway. And I just couldn't comprehend why they would do that. They went ahead, they had a real problem, they ended up using a cooler that they had developed in-house and it was, did not perform, and it didn't perform. You know, they, they identified it as a risk, and so instead of going to an off-the-shelf cooler that would have functioned better, they continued on to use this self-developed cooler, and in the long run, it didn't work. So I ended up having to go back anyway. So this is an example of, of this kind of uh, risk assessment. So what, why they put numbers in here, they're identifying uh, specific things. So one is the primary mirror focus failure on an orbit. Well, you don't want that. The primary mirror fails, you can't make any measurements. Um, Filter wheel drive fails during testing. Well, that's also really bad. It's, it's a real big problem. If it fails during testing, at least, that's something you can fix. You haven't launched it. Does everybody understand what the filter wheel is? OK, we're going to talk about filter wheel radiometers. What filter wheels do, filters come in and they pick out the different wavelengths. And so it's, it's staring, and it has a wheel with these filters in it. And the filters come into view. What really amazes me is how quickly they do that. They do that in milliseconds. This thing is, must be screaming around. And they bingo, 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 go through these different wavelengths. So that's the filter wheel. Very simple, and a lot of the older instruments, like the AVHR, are still a filter wheel radiometer still uses a wheel that passes these filters <coughs> past the uh, radiation. Foto focal plane integration slip six months. Well, that says, you know, you're still working on the focal plane. You don't have it available to the instrument. So that's a major slip. It's a <coughs> and it can happen pretty easily. And the ADD converter noise is too big. Well, <clears throat> that's a loss, but it doesn't happen that often. 
So you need to develop a risk reduction plan for all of the unacceptable risks. So <clears throat> what are you going to do? How are you going to compensate for these risks so that you can get everything moved down towards the green line? The things that you can fool with, mass, power, volume, operating time, optical bandwidth, data storage, processing cap capacity. So these are all aspects of the instrument that you can think about and you can <clears throat> make some changes. So mass is um, Im important and uh, it's <clears throat> a, a critical factor, but not as critical as some of these other ones. These other ones are basically dictating what the instrument is doing. And that, that can be one of the biggest problems. Okay. Okay, the systems engineering processes, you develop the requirements, you do this functional partitioning, and, and you'll still have to go through that. You go through your design parameters. Now, this is called configuration control. And this is when you're working in a company, and that's so that they can control these IPT groups. They can't get away because they have to fit all of these requirements. And then they make the trade studies. So you will still be doing trade studies. So this is uh, a typical requirements development uh, breakdown. So <clears throat> you're going to have all these subsystems, which are all, all going to have components. And the final um, result is, is the system. So they use this same V diagram for functional partitioning. So they're basically breaking out the things that the instrument has to do. And these are all, these slides are all on, on the web, so you, on, on D2L, so you can look at them. Functional partitioning, <clears throat> you want to pick fundamental elements that you're not going to go beyond. Um, then you need to look at how these elements work together, and you need to find out what is, you know, your maximum level that you could go to. And, and since cost is not a factor in your design, but you need to still be somewhat realistic. I mean, if you, if you propose an instrument that's going to cost, you know, two or three billion dollars, that's not going to really be too useful because nobody's going to give you that kind of money to build it. Okay, and we've already talked a lot about trade studies. So this is an example, and, and this kind of an example may be useful to you in, in your design efforts. So you need to talk, think about your focal plane, how it's going to capture the photons, how you're going to digitize the photons, how you're going to go into a processor, how is the data going to get in there, what do you need in terms of thermal control, power conditioning, what kind of con power can you utilize, and then how are you going to get the data to the ground. So this is another, those are, that's one example. Here's another example. It treats this slightly differently. Okay, so there's, you can think of it in a couple of ways. <clears throat> so um, this separates the noise sensitive elements from the noise generators. And this one simplifies the focal plane array, but mixes the noise sensitive and noise generating elements, which creates complex cabling. Okay, configuration control, you don't need to worry about because you'll be talking to yourself. Um, but in a company, this is really important. Okay, in a company, and you guys are you're going to probably end up working at a company, they're going to have somebody that does this. And you need to be responsible to this, this activity. If you can't meet those <coughs> expectations, you're going to find out that you, you know, they're not too happy with your contribution to the effort. So there is this thing called configuration control, which basically tries to capture all of the things that are happening in systems engineering 
and basically tries to maintain the cost and schedule requirements. So they try not to go away from them. Okay, uh, requirements flow down. You hear a lot about this in companies. They, they all talk about flow down requirements. So they're all taking the main requirements and they're moving it into the area they work on. Okay, so the flow down means, you know, there's this, I'm going to measure X. Well, X comes down to me. I need to worry about the calibration that will make sure I can measure X. I'm only going to worry about calibration. That's my job. But I need to realize that's the, the question I'm answering. Then you hear a lot about ICDs, interface control documents. These are documents that actually address every little nitty-gritty of the parts, even the parts of the instrument. There's going to be ICDs telling you how to hook up the focal plane array. There's going to be ICD to tell you how to put in the telescope, tell you where to put the mirrors. All of this stuff is going to be in there. So trade studies are just what they sound like. You're going to look at different options. Um, <clears throat> you want to try to find an optimized solution. This is too small a diagram. It's an eye chart for, for you guys. <clears throat> uh, but this is looking at different ways of solving the same problem and finding the best solution. So that's it for today. And on Monday, we'll be talking about um, another part of systems engineering. And then, like I said, on Wednesday, we talk about calibration and, and um, characterization, which are two different things. Characterization just says, you know, is the instrument doing what it's supposed to do? Calibration is, is in measuring the, the val value that we want. Any questions? I know you guys are having a hard time. <laughs> it's after lunch, and this sounds kind of boring, but it, it, it really isn't if you get into the corporate environment. If you get into the corporate environment, this stuff is going to come back to you. And, and it really, you know, you're going to feel like it's a different foreign language. People are talking about ICDs and IPTs, and you're going, what? But, you know, it, that's the way they talk. That's the way they function. So the sooner you can adapt to that kind of language, the better. Any questions? All right, so go enjoy your Friday. See you Monday. <laughs>